So I'm very excited to welcome someone to the stage who is a partner of Nexus in the way that we are the most proud. Please welcome Patrick McCarthy from the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to make the case that you have an opportunity to join a movement to close every youth prison in America. I want to start by telling you the story of two young people. Is that better? Good. Two young people. Uh, one of them is my son. It was Halloween night. It was late. I got a phone call. I think I'll walk over here. I got a phone call, and it was the police. It turns out that my son and a bunch of his buddies thought it'd be a great idea to take their senior yearbook photo down at the elementary school. Now, it was Halloween, and they thought it'd be really cool to get a huge mound of pumpkins to pose in front of. Now, it was late, so the trick-or-treaters were gone, so they all went around the neighborhood taking pumpkins and made this huge mound of pumpkins. And just as they were about to take the picture, a cop car showed up. They were all taken down to the station. They were charged with uh, disorderly conduct, which for most of these young men would not have been a big deal, maybe probation, maybe a station house adjustment. But my son, my son had already been in trouble with the law. He was on probation. And he'd had a series of interactions with the police, and his probation officer had had it. So she wanted to have him admitted to detention. She thought it'd be a good idea to teach him a lesson. Now, you should know that when she made that call, she probably didn't realize that I had been the commissioner of juvenile justice in another state. I had run detention programs. I knew what detention programs were. So because we had some resources, we hired a lawyer. We put a plan together. We got my son into treatment. And we convinced the judge not to put him in detention. Now, I'll tell you that this was a community that invested in young people, that had high expectations of their young people. So the judge was amenable to this plan. He was part of a public school system that invested in young people and had high expectations of young people. And so they were amenable to the plan as well. Now I want to tell you about another young man who was actually very similar to my son, Chris. This young man's name was Jerome. I met Jerome when I was responsible for the juvenile justice system in the state. Jerome was a 17-year-old, just like my son. He was an African-American young man. He had been on probation. He violated his probation, and he was, in fact, incarcerated. So let me tell you how I met Jerome. I had stopped over at the facility, as I used to do at night, because that's when bad things happen. And I was looking at Unit 4, and there was a big commotion going on. So I went into the unit. And there were four correctional officers wrestling Jerome into an isolation cell. So I waited till they had moved Jerome in, and I asked the guy in charge, whose name was Dennis, I said, Dennis, what, what's going on with this kid? And Dennis, by the way, was the shop steward, wasn't a big fan of mine. And uh, he kind of gave me a look, and he said, well, come on over here. So he walked me over to the isolation cell. He unlocked it, gestured for me to go in. And I walked in, and he closed and locked the door behind me. So use this instead. OK. So here I was. That's a lot better. <laughs> so here I was with uh, this young man who had just taken on four of our correctional officers and thrown them around a bit. He was furious. He was, his shoulders were going up and down. And you know I was a little bit nervous about this whole thing. So I just started to talk to him. Didn't know what else to do. And gradually, his breathing slowed down. And he I don't know if he's listening or not. He was just sitting on his bed as I was talking to him. And all of a sudden, I saw this tear coming down his face. And it was in that moment that I realized that Jerome really was not that much different from my own child. He was a young guy who'd done some dumb things. He was in way over his head, and he was in despair. But Jerome was not a young man for whom 
people had high expectations or in whom they had invested. So I want to make the case for why youth prison is the wrong response to young people like Chris or Jerome. Let's start with the incarceration rate in our country. The incarceration rate for young people is the highest in the world, and it's not even close. It's more than twice as high as the next highest. The cost of our incarceration of young people is unbelievable. For one child for a year, it costs anywhere from 100000 and in some states, $250,000 a year to incarcerate a young person. Now, some people would say, well, if what we do works, then it's worth that kind of investment if it turns a young life around. So let's look at what we expect for that kind of investment. We expect that communities will be safer, but in fact, 70 to 80% of young people who are incarcerated are arrested and incarcerated again for a crime. We expect our juvenile justice system to keep kids safe. But 30 states, 30 states in the last decade have documented instances of physical abuse, sexual abuse, and improper use of isolation and chemical restraints. We expect that our juvenile justice system will help get kids back on track, but in fact, they set kids up for lifelong failure. They are literally factories of failure. Perhaps the most important reason why we should close youth prisons is because they fail what I call the my child test. It's a simple test. For those of us who work in policy or practice or program, the simple test is if it's not good enough for my child, why would I want it for someone else's child? So let me give you a better sense of what these places are actually like and imagine if you or one of your children or your brother or a friend, if you would want them there. When I took over this job to run juvenile justice, I frankly, for the first time in my life, walked into a correctional facility for young people, a youth prison. Let me tell you what I saw as I walked around. I saw a facility that was built for 40 young people. There were 100 young people in that facility. There were bright, glaring lights everywhere, just constant, bright, glaring lights. There was a barrage of noise that was unbelievable reverberating off the hard surface, uh, surfaces. I saw young people in sweats, many of them with holes on them. I saw young people in shackles and handcuffs. I saw um, mace on the belt of guards. The walls themselves seemed to ooze the sense of stress. I saw young people in isolation cells. I saw this imminent sense that at any moment violence could break out, a sense of fear and, and anger. Now we know from research that everything I just described could be seen as a trigger for trauma. And many of our young people have experienced trauma before they arrived. And the reaction to these triggers is a sense of anger, aggression, depression, withdrawal, all things that we say, see, we knew that they, were, that they needed this setting because look how they're behaving. The very environment pulls forth what we don't want for our young people. So I believe that these factories of failure are actually designed in a way that is exactly the opposite of what young people need. We know that young people are very susceptible to peer influence, they need positive peer influence. So we lock them away with other young people who have gotten in trouble with the law and create these intense peer relationships which lead to kind of a schools in, of, of, of crime. We know that young people need supportive adult relationships. These facilities pit adults and kids in this kind of power struggle for control. We know that young people need positive developmental experience. They need to develop emotional maturity. They need to develop judgment and impulse control. 
Instead, we put them in places where although they, they know that they've made mistakes, instead of learning that those mistakes, in fact, are uh, making a bad choice, they are told again and again that they are bad people. We know that young people need a sense of a positive self-image, but these facilities tell them in a hundred different ways that they are simultaneously dangerous and worthless and that they have no real future. And finally, we know that young people need a safe, nurturing environment in order to develop and grow. These facilities are in fact dangerous and threatening to young people. So what should we do? We need to start by admitting failure and recognizing that we need to close every youth prison in America. Now there are four steps to doing this, I call it the four R's, very straightforward. First, we've got to reduce the number of young people who are going into these facilities. We've already done a lot to do that. The Populations have been reduced about 40 to 50 percent, but nevertheless, 63 percent of young people who are incarcerated today are there for nonviolent offenses. So there's a lot more to be done. Second, we need to reform the system itself, reform how we make decisions to eliminate the kind of biases that are pervasive in the system, reform our community-based services so they're more oriented towards positive youth development, and very importantly, reform the way we conduct probation. Third, we need to replace these adult-like institutions with community-based, close-to-home, rehabilitation-focused, treatment-focused, smaller programs for those few young people who will need some period of secure care. I'm not saying that no young person ever needs to be in secure care, but it ought to be in a facility that's going to help get him or her back on track. And finally, the fourth R, we need to take some of this money we're spending and wasting and actually making things worse and reinvest it in community-based services. This is a pretty bold vision, I recognize, but it's actually quite doable. As I said, the populations are already down 40 to 50 percent in youth prisons. That means it's getting to a number that's much more uh, manageable. Second, we have seen the development of programs that actually work and are effective with young people that years ago we would have locked up. We can do more in that area. The public, by polling, supports this. There's bipartisan support for moving in this direction. These are 11 states that have either already closed many of their youth prisons or have announced their intention to close youth prisons. So we have examples from around the country where this is, is working. I want to close my talk with one last story about a group of young people. The Casey Foundation believes that we need to involve uh, everyone in thinking about what our best solutions are. So we created a juvenile justice advisory group made up of young people who had been incarcerated. So we had a meeting of these young people in Baltimore and two of the young people actually had been participating while they were still incarcerated. They had been Skyping into the meetings. They had since been released, so this was a pretty big deal. It was the first time everybody was together. So they came to Baltimore and they had a great meeting and we decided to take them out to dinner. Now I didn't go, but one of our staff folks went and they went to a pretty nice restaurant uh, in, in Baltimore. And you know these are young people, and they would had a great day. They were excited. They are a little bit boisterous, a little bit loud, laughing, having a good time. And our staff person was a little bit anxious about how this would go down in this kind of semi-fancy restaurant. And sure enough, there was a couple across the room, older couple, kind of watching and whispering, and kept looking at this group and whispering. And he was getting more and more nervous that there was going to be a problem. And the uh, gentleman from the couple started walking towards the table. So now the staff person was really anxious and he thought, huh, this is going to be embarrassing. And the man came up and he said, um, so where did you match? So staff person, none of the young people had any idea what this guy was talking about. What well, turns out, the gentleman was a physician. And by coincidence, this was the day when medical students get matched to their residency. And he assumed this group of young folks, all of whom have been incarcerated, were celebrating their residency match. 
Now, can you imagine what these young people's lives would have been like if every day of their lives they were seen as having that kind of potential? Now, I'm here to tell you this is a tremendous group of young people, and they're going to do great things. But can you imagine if we had invested and if we'd expected of them that they would have the kind of potential that they would complete medical school and go on to residency or whatever the heck they wanted to do. So I'm here today to invite you to join this movement, this movement to tell our young people that we will invest in you, that we have high expectations of you. We will hold you accountable, of course, but in a way that leaves you protected and cared for and loved and nurtured. That's the kind of juvenile justice system we should have. And I hope you'll join me in making it a reality. Thank you very much.